school training at NYU. And then uh, he came to Columbia Urology for his, uro uh, for his residency. Um, I'm proud to call him my senior resident. He taught me so much. He graduated um, from residency in 2012. I was a year below him. And both him and our next speaker, Chad Rich, um, were some of my, are still some of my best friends. They're like brothers to me, uh, wonderful people. Um, Trushar stayed at Columbia for uh, another year um, doing uh, fellowship in robotics and minimally invasive surgery with Dr. Badani, who was at Columbia at the time. And then he's went on uh, to practice at the University of South Florida, where he's been extremely productive and busy. Congratulations on your recent promotion to Associate Professor of Urology, uh, Trushar. And Trushar is also the program director for University of South Florida. So I'm really so happy to have you here today. And uh, as everyone in the audience has seen, many of our faculty, Dr. Cooper, Dr. Katz are tuning in just to see you and reminisce. So I'm gonna let you get started because we have a little, I know that you have cases and you've made an effort to join us this morning and give back to New York and we appreciate that. So I'll let you get started. Thanks, Gina. Uh, I thank you for the introduction. I, I really appreciate that. You know, as Gina was saying, I, I you know, I, I grew up in, in New York, New Jersey, did my uh, medical school training, my residency and fellowship out there. Uh, and so I have a lot of friends and family still up there. And, and I just want to let everybody know who's up there. We really appreciate and acknowledge what you guys have been doing during the pandemic. Uh, it doesn't go unnoticed down here. Uh, you know, we, we're really proud of the work you guys have done and, uh, you know, we wish you all the best and, uh, you know, um, you know, moving forward, I think, uh, you know, um, we, we kudos to everybody up there. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope everybody stays safe and, and, and hopefully things continue to improve as we move forward. So, you know, <clears throat> I remember a couple, you know, a month or two ago, Kim, Dr. Cooper was asking me, you know, to give a talk and, and, and as I was looking through all the slide, you know, the present pre presenters, you know, every talk that I wanted to give was already taken, uh, and, you know, uh, adrenal neoplasms, uh, BCG, uh, uh, management of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, prostate cancer. So I, I kind of was thinking about, you know, different topics that really haven't been spoken about. So one of the things that came up was adult renal cyst disease. And, you know, this is not a topic that's, you know, super complicated and down to the, you know, to, to evil, the most naive uh, intern, they really know how to manage this disease. So I really kind of titled this talk on why you know what you know and kind of give you a his historical perspective on adult renal cyst disease and kind of kind of go over the background and kind of go over some newer concepts and how in terms of we manage these, uh, these patients. Right, let me slide here. I don't have any disclosures. So just as an overview, we're gonna go over some epidemiology. We're gonna go over some of the diagnostic modalities that we use. Obviously, we're gonna talk about classification systems. And finally, we're gonna to touch upon uh, some management options. So when we look at, talk about renal cyst, cyst, it actually comes from the Greek word kystis, which comes from bladder or pouch. Uh, it's defined as having, it's a closed sac, having a membrane and a division compared to the nearby tissue. The cyst can contain fluid, can contain blood, can contain semi-solid material. And if the cavity lacks a distinct membrane, it's really called a pseudocyst, not a cyst. The first mention of renal cysts comes from uh, William Fabry, who was considered the father of German surgery. Um, you know, after his death, uh, the 600 observations of treatment was published in 1641. So where he described renal cysts through his anatomical dissections. Of note, he also treated bladder stones and hydrocele's. Um, Pierre Rayer was a French surgeon. Um, he's considered one of the fathers of nephrology. In 1837, he gives us the first modern day anatomical description of renal cysts. I mean, he also studied urinary sediments and he also helped describe nephrotic and nephritic disease. So in terms of renal cysts, we obviously know most are incidentally found. Um, there's a growing incidence due to the use of abdominal imaging. If you look back, you know, in some of the papers from the early 20s and the 30s in the Journal of Urology. And when they talk about renal cysts, they'll talk about how rare that entity is. And that's really due to the lack of any imaging at that period of time. Um, if you look at the incidence of um, uh, incidence rate of cysts, 
Um, you know, a third of males over the age of 70 will have be diagnosed with a renal cyst. So it's actually, you know, pretty common. And if you look at the age distribution, you see as you get older, your risk um, increases. And there seems to be a higher incidence of cysts uh, in males versus females. In terms of risk factors for renal cysts, obviously age we mentioned, male gender, uh, end-stage renal disease can lead to multiple cysts, smoking. Uh, in terms of hypertension and diabetes, there's been mis uh, mixed results um, and conflicting results are really hard to make any conclusions on that. And there's multiple syndromes that have been associated with renal cysts from autosomal dominant polykidney disease to uh, tuberous sclerosis down to medullary response disease. So, you know, there's, there's a number of syndromes that can be associated with this. And, um, you know, this can be a, a talk on its own, but just for you guys to have um, as a reference. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of renal cysts, we know they do not communicate with the collecting system. The vast majority of them are asymptomatic. Um, you know, large cysts, I mean, obviously the one pictured here can cause mass effect, uh, which can result in discomfort. Obviously, cysts sometimes can become infected, re resulting in an abscess, can, and that can be symptomatic. And then we've seen patients with uh, bleeding, cyst rupture, and that can cause to, uh, symptoms. Um, in terms of pathogenesis, so Rudolf Virchow, I mean, the father of modern pathology, every medical student knows who he is. You know, his contributions include cell theory, describing leukemia, Virchow's node. Um, you know, he proposed a pathogenesis where he described that <clears throat> cysts were due to an obstructive uric acid crystals or papillary duct atresia. Um, if you look what's out there in the literature, there's really proposed theories. And I don't think we can, you know, anyone's going to hold their breath on figuring this out. But, you know, some of the thoughts are that cysts are due to diverticuli in the distal convoluted tubule or collecting duct. Um, and that's caused by weakening in the basement membrane, which is caused by back pressure or age. Uh, there's thoughts that ischemia or injury can cause aberrant hypertrophic changes. Um, and as patients get over, they think um, subclinical injury can cause a decline in the GFR and the prevalence of cysts. Uh, in terms of histology, um, it's a lining of a single epithelial cell layer without any renal elements. Um, and there's a clear or straw colored fluid that resembles a plasma filtrate. Um, so in terms of uh, a, a basic radiographic evaluation of cysts, you know, the, the metallics that we use um, are ultrasound, CTE, and MR. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of briefly go over some concepts um, in terms of radiographic imaging. Um, you know, when we're, when we're evaluating these cysts, we have to differentiate them from hydronephrosis and obviously chelicyl diverticulums, which which can mimic cysts. Um, and then we have to assess their complexity, which um, when the importance of that is looking at its risk of potential malignancy. Um, you know, there are multiple terms that we have to be comfortable with when we're describing renal cysts and those include calcification, uh, hyperdensity, uh, hyperdensity, septations, enhancement, nodularity, and um, multi-loculated. Uh, um, in terms of calcification, um, calcification, calcification can either be smooth, it can be linear, you can have milko calcium, which um, is almost like a fluid -like substance that can be to the cyst. Um, you can have uh, nodules that have calcification uh, and then you need to rule out enhancement um, in, those, um, in those cases. Hyperdensity um, <clears throat> usually indicates hemorrhage or high protein content of the cyst. On CT scan, you're going to see the is greater than 20 uh, on a non-enhanced CT. Uh, on MRI, you're going to see a higher signal intensity than water on T1 weighted imaging. Uh, Somebody has to mute themselves, please. The person logged in is Shanghai Mutabira. Please mute yourself. Um, in, in terms of septation, so a septation is a dividing wall or a membrane between two spaces, masses of tissue. Um, you know, classically, the, the definition of thin and thick has been um, has been subjective. Uh, you know, usually thin is considered less than one millimeter. Um, but obviously they can be thicker than that. They can be irregular, they can be nodular, and they can actually show enhancement. And, and, and they can also have calcifications, which is used in how we uh, describe them and go on to further classification systems. 
enhancement. Um, so this is an increase, increase in household units of the mass after con contrast injection. Um, if you see an increase between 20, 10 and 20, that's considered intermediate. Uh, above 20, that you, you, that's gonna be considered enhancement. Um, you're gonna evaluate this. <clears throat> we're, we're really looking for enhancement in septa or the solid components of the cyst to help differentiate um, you know, its risk of malignancy. And anytime you see some element of enhancement, there is a concern for malignancy and that should be appropriately evaluated. Uh, multi-loculated, so any mass uh, or cyst with three or more septa are not considered multi -septated. It's actually called multi-loculated. Uh, the most common diagnosis that you can see are multilocular cystic nephroma versus a multilocular renal cell carcinoma. Unfortunately, you cannot make this distinction radiographically. And so when you see something like this present, um, the typical um, management is going to be surgical excision. Uh, in terms of just kind of, you know, basic renal ultrasound, um, you know, features of renal cysts, you know, most cysts or simple cysts are gonna be well marginated anechoic lesions with thin walls. Um, obviously, we, we all know about the posterior acoustic enhancement, uh, which may be present. Um, it's, this finding is nonspecific and you're really not gonna potentially see this on some of the smaller cysts. On CT imaging, uh, simple cysts are well marginated. You can have thin or, uh, or uh, um, thin walls. Um, they should not enhance, and they usually have a house field unit count of less than 20. Obviously, we talked about the enhancement, so we're really using a change of over 20 as, a, as we consider enhancement either in the septa or solid components of it. MR, typically MR is used to help clarify um, possible hemorrhagic cysts on CT scan. So uh, it should show appropriate changes with a higher signal intensity with T1, decreased T2, and a lack of enhancement. Anytime, just like on CT scans, if you have an enhancement or an MRI, um, this is suggestive of malignancy and we should be uh, view this with suspicion. So obviously any talk of uh, renal cyst, you can't not talk about the Bosniak classification system. Uh, so who was Dr. Bosniak? So Morton Bosniak, he was a prefer professor emeritus of radiology at NYU. Um, he created the first abdominal imaging fellowship in the United States. And obviously his signature work is the classification uh, system of malignant potential for cystic renal masses. Um, and so this is the, the seminal paper from 1986 that Dr. Bosniak published. Uh, you know, describing the Bosnia classification system. And if you look at it through this paper, um, there are no tables, there are no table ones, there's no plots, and there really is no data presented here. And this really is a very, this, this paper is really a descriptive pr paper describing his experience um, with CT scans and body imaging and his experience with describing renal cysts. And, and we have to kind of think about in 1986, you know, what is the history of CT scan to kind of, you know, um, allow for such a paper to have such a huge impact. And, you know, the CT scanner was only invented in 1972 by Godfrey Hounsfield and Alan Cormack. And, you know, that invention actually was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1979. The first abdominal imaging was available in 1976. So that the year Dr. Bosniak published his paper in 1986, this is the infancy of abdominal imaging. And so he was really just describing his, his first experience with that. And so as such, there was um, <clears throat> you know, limited data for him to present. Um, the Bosnia classification, it's based on the use of CT imaging. Um, the goal is to guide surveillance versus treatment recommendations. In 1986, there was four categories, one, two, three, and four. In 1993, this was modified to include the additional 2F category. And this was introduced by the fact that they were operating on a lot of Bosniak three cysts and they found out many of these cysts were actually benign and such. Um, they, you know, added this cyst, uh, added this new classification. So now that we have, we have a stratification of five. I'm going to go through these individually here. So Bosniak one, what does that mean? So these are what we consider simple cysts, benign cysts. Uh, they have thin walls. There's no septa. There's no solid components. They have a density of water with no enhancement. This is just the run of the mill, regular simple cyst that we commonly see. Bosniak II, again, considered a benign renal cyst. Uh, they have 
few thin septa. They have they can have fine calcifications in the wall. Um, you know they can be hi hyper dense, and, use, and this includes uh, lesions that are less than three centimeters. Uh, and again, these are non-enhancing lesions. 2F uh, lesions, these uh, lesions can have uh, a thin septa with perceived mild enhancement. So they don't really have enhancement, but it just seems like they do. Uh, they can have thick nod nodular calcifications in the wall or septa. There's no enhancing soft tissue components. And these, these, this class, of, um, class includes high attenuate, attenuation lesions, so hyperdense cysts greater than three centimeters. Bosniak three, these are considered indeterminate cystic masses. Um, they're, they can have thickened irregular septa, which can enhance. Uh, they can have thick nodular calcifications. And so when you're thinking about enhancement, um, you can see enhancement in Bosniak three cysts in the wall or septum, but there is no soft tissue enhancing components. And that's the <clears throat> distinguishing factor between Bosniak three and four. Um, so Bosniak 4, so these are considered malignant cystic masses with some cystic components. They have all the characteristics of Bosniak 3 lesions. And, um, you know, all, again, like I said, the only uh, distinguishing factor here is they will have soft tissue components uh, that enhance, that are independent, but adjacent to uh, uh, any septa in, in the renal cyst. This is just a kind of a table to organize what we just talked about. Uh, I think it's really a nice way for, for the residents and medical students to study uh, with, with, with these kind of tables. So uh, everything we just talked about is kind of nicely organized here. So this is just for your reference moving forward. Uh, just a quick note on the role of biopsy uh, of renal cysts in terms of you know, guiding our management options. You know, generally it's not recommended. And you know, this is a quote from Dr. Bosniak, you know, uh, a core biopsy of the wall of a cystic lesion can cause it to rupture and spill its contents into surrounding tissue. Although considered rare, the needle tract spread of tumor is an underestimated risk. So, um, <clears throat> you know, typically we're not doing this. The false negative rate has been as high as 21%. And uh, these cystic lesions are difficult to biopsy because they have less bulk of tissue to sample. The only time where you could consider doing a biopsy of a cyst is if you're worried about um, an abscess or an inflammatory process where uh, a puncture is acceptable because it almost acts like a drain. Uh, this is just kind of, you know, to, you know, to kind of give you guys an update. Uh, there are proposed changes to the Bosnia classifications that have come up. Um, you know, the goal is to improve the accuracy and in, in the ability to predict malignancy. And I think one of the hallmarks that has made the Bosniak uh, classification last uh, is the, it's, its relative simplicity. Uh, and I think this, these new, um, you know, proposed changes, uh, you know, add a, you know, significant level of complexity to the system, which may not necessarily give us any clinical benefit. So they're thinking about incorporating CT and MR imaging modalities which would further divide uh, Bosniak 2 cyst. Uh, there'd be six subtypes based on CT scan, three subtypes uh, based on MRI, and this would be based on attenuation and intensity levels. Uh, they're trying to make terms such as thin, minimally thick, uh, nodule more objective in, in this new classification. So uh, just as something to, just to think about on the horizon, it has not been validated, has not been accepted. Um, and, I, and I think as we go through the talk, I, 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 you'll kind of see, I don't know, necessarily think that this is actually needed. So in terms of validation of the Bosnia classifications, and so you saw that paper from 1986, there was no, there, there was no data to be presented. Um, and so I found the most comprehensive uh, meta-analysis that was published in 2017. This looked at a pooled analysis of 35 total studies. There was eight studies included before the 2F classification, 27 after and it included over 2,500 total lesions. And if we look at the malignancy rate in this study, we see that, that for Bosniak 1, uh, the rate was 3.2%. Now, nobody believes that a Bosniak 1 cyst is, could truly be malignant. I think this represents a misclassification rate. And in, in the paper, they kind of cite some, uh, some points where uh, tumors uh, may have been missed. And, and you have to remember, we're, we're talking papers that you know, this meta-analysis goes over almost 40 years and you have some studies, including the early period of radiology, um, which could affect this. Bosniak and 2 and 2F, uh, the rate of malignancy was 6 and 6.7 respectively. There was no statistical difference in the malignancy rate, which was an interesting finding. 
Um, and I think this has to do with the inclusion of stu uh, studies without 2F categories. So you, you can't tease out which is what. And the other thought process is if that many to most of these 2F SIFs were managed conservatively without pathological confirmation, you're going to see significant, I mean, you're going to see sim similar malignancy rates because you can't, obviously, if, you, have, if you, you don't operate on them, you're not going to know which ones are malignant and which ones are not. Bosniak 3, the rate was 55%. Um, if you look through the studies, this has the highest rate of heterogeneity. And this has to do with reader experience and, and the CT technology. So, I, you know, when, when you talk to radiologists, Bosniak 3 are usually the hardest ones for them to truly describe. Uh, the rate of malignancy in Bosniak 4 was 91%. Um, they comment that the, the, some of the lesions that were benign Bosniak 4 lesions were less than two centimeters. They had hemorrhagic components and they had a diagnosis of cystic nephroma and oncocytoma, so they can mimic potentially Bosniak 4 cysts. So what's next? What do we do with these cysts? So when I was a resident, you know, and Gina was my resident, you know, was when I were, and I were in conference, what we were taught was, well, Bosniak 1 and 2, you're going to, you're, you're going to, you're not going to treat them. You're just going to put them on surveillance. Bosniak 2F, um, you're going to typically surveil these masses. And then Bosniak 3 and 4, those patients would end up going to the operating room for potentially a partial nephrectomy or depending on the size, maybe even a radical nephrectomy. Um, and the question is, does that actually still hold true nowadays? Just from a historical you know, perspective, if anyone's interested, you know, while I was making this talk, you know, it's interesting to note that they were doing surgery like this in the 1800s. And the first documentation of an aspiration of a renal cyst was in 1861. That led to peritonitis and sepsis and death of a patient. Uh, in 1875, the first documented successful nephrectomy for a renal cyst was done. And then 1884, the first transperitoneal excision of a renal cyst was done. And so obviously this is in the era of, you know, without any form of abdominal imaging. And you can imagine how large these cysts must have been for uh, patients to either be symptomatic and obviously be able to be seen on physical exam. So I just wanted to kind of go over um, you know, some of the thought processes on uh, Bosniak 2F and greater cysts. So this was a paper published in 2009 from NYU uh, uh, from Dr. Tanasia's group, and it included 112 patients with renal cysts. Uh, 81 of them were Bosniak 2F, 31 Bosniak 3. The mean size was 3.1 and 3.4 centimeters. So I think the size is important to kind of note in these studies. So when they looked at the progression rate of 2F cysts, they found that 15% of these uh, lesions progressed in a median of 11 months. Uh, five of those patients underwent surgery and they all ended up having renal cell carcinoma. When they looked at, uh, you know, uh, some of the characteristics, they found no differences in tumor or patient characteristics to help dif uh, differentiate those who would progress and those who remain stable. Uh, in this paper, the Bosniak 3 lesions, the, who underwent surgical um, resection, the malignancy rate was higher than, you know, the meta-analysis. Uh, it was 81 percent. Uh, the majority of these tumors were low grade and lower stage, so 95 were graded less than T2 and 93 percent were less than grade um, 2. The median follow-up was six months, and in that period, in this short, there was no recurrences. So I think the two interesting take-home points from this study is, number one, you see that about 10 to 15 percent of these 2F lesions will progress usually within a year, and of the tumors that are malignant in Bosniak 3, the majority of them are low grade, low stage. So that potentially um, um, indicates a low malignant potential for the future. This was a study, a European study published in 2014, similar to what, uh, to what Dr. Tanasia published. Uh, this included um, 72 patients with 2F, 31 with Bosniak 3 and 22 with Bosniak 4. They did not include um, um, the size of the cysts in the paper. Um, so when they looked at the progression rate of 2F cysts, so 13% progressed. And interestingly, the median time was again 11 months. So if these tumors are going to uh, um, progress, it's usually within a year. Uh, eight of those 10 end up went surgery and they were found to have uh, renal cell carcinoma. So that rate was 87.5% um, of the Bosniak three and four lesions. The rate was 62 and 85%, which you know, seemed to be in line with prior published studies. Um, <clears throat> in patients who were conservatively managed, um, the Bosniak two, so 72% remained stable. And again, 12.5 uh, actually regressed. So you had about 10 to 12% of them progress, and then you have about 12% regress. 
Um, Bosniak three, uh, 48% of them were managed conservatively and a median follow-up of 24 months. There was no evidence of metastatic disease. Uh, Bosniak four, about half again were managed conservatively. And again, there was no evidence of metastatic disease within two years. And if you look at overall survival, whether based on your you know, level of Bosniak classification 2, F3, or 4, there was no difference in survival. And, and interestingly, note, there was no difference in survival whether you had surveillance or surgery for your renal cyst. So it kind of, you know, gives more evidence to the fact that these, these, these lesions have a low malignant potential and potentially have an indolent course that may not need any form of treatment. Um, this is, was an important paper that came out of the Journal of Urology in 2018 out of Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, it included two cohorts, uh, 138 patients that underwent surgery for a cystic mass and 72 patients who underwent observation for a cystic mass. And the definition they used for the masses was they had to be, have a cystic component that was greater than 50% of the total mass of, uh, of the mass. If you look at the Bosnia classification uh, rate in this study um, the, of the patients who underwent surgery, uh, over 90% of them were Bosniak 3 and 4. Of the patients who underwent surveillance, about half of them were 2F. Um, in the surgery cohort, uh, the median side was 3.3 centimeters. 84% um, had partial nephrectomy. Uh, about 75% of them were all uh, were, um, gave, came back as a diagnosis of renal cell carcinoma. Um, and at a median follow-up of 5.4 years, there was no evidence of any tumor recurrence or metastasis. So this, this is despite the fact that uh, you know, 75% of them were renal cell carcinomas. In the surveillance cohort, the mean size was 3.1 centimeters. Uh, they noted a growth rate about one millimeter per year and 2.3 millimeters per year for the solid component. Um, 11 of these patients ended up having delayed surgery uh, and 63% of those had renal cell carcinoma. Again, about half of each had a T1 or grade two. And at a median follow-up of 4.3 years, there was no evidence of recurrence or metastasis in this cohort. So I think what you can conclude from this is, um, you know, using a standardized radio, radiologic threshold of greater than 50% cystic component, um, the cystic RCCs have an excellent prognosis on both active surveillance and or following surgery. Um, and I think it gives more evidence to the fact that you can use active surveillance um, for not only Bosniak 2 f cysts, but also Bosniak 3 and 4 complex cystic lesions. The last paper here, this is out of Columbia. Um, um, as you see, all the papers I'm kind of referenced to are New York based papers here. Uh, this was a retrospective review, had a follow up of 2.7 years, um, and this included 138 patients. Um, all of these cysts, again, were less than four centimeters. Um, and so all, and, and nobody in this cohort had any surgery. And they found that 88% of uh, two F st uh, cysts remained stable or were downgraded. And they also showed that 45% of, of, of Bosniak three and four cysts were actually downgraded um, to two F or lower uh, in this uh, follow-up period. So again, not all Bosniak three and four cysts are dangerous. Uh, and even some of them will actually regress over time. Um, so, um, 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 so that's something interesting to know. Obviously, we all like guidelines. So there's no AUA guidelines on risk renal cystic lesions. This is from the Canadian, Canadian Urological Association. Um, you know, and if you look at um, their recommendations for Bosniak 2F, uh, they recommend follow-up imaging at six and 12 months, which makes sense uh, based on the data that shows that majority of these tumors will uh, progress within the first year um, and then annually up to five years. For Bosniak 3, um, surgical excision is still uh, recommended, um, but they do mention conservative management and, RF, uh, and RFA in select cases. And Bosniak 4, same thing. Uh, they, they consider it malignant until proven otherwise, and surgical excision is suggested um, <clears throat> and RFA and conservative management in select cases. Uh, so to conclude here, I know I kind of ran through this quickly, uh, um, but I think <clears throat> what we've seen here is that Bosniak 2 cysts warrant surveillance for at least one to two years, uh, about 10 to 15 percent will progress. But I think, you know, we, I think you have to take this to understand that despite progression and despite the risk of malignancy in these lesions, uh, I think active surveillance can still be considered. And, um, and, and that said, the management of complex uh, three and four Bosniak cysts is evolving. Um, and I think there's more data to support um, that you can use uh, active surveillance in these lesions. Uh, 
especially those that are less than four centimeters. Um, obviously, if these lesions are greater than four centimeters, I think, uh, I think, I think we're, most people are going to still uh, recommend surgical excision. But as you see, we see more of these kind of lesions in older individuals. Um, and I think potentially we're doing too much surgery. Um, and so even in these complex lesions, I think active surveillance is going to be more an important part of our, 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 our tool set in terms of managing them. So with that, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank Gina. I want to thank Dr. Cooper. And again, I want to thank everybody in New York, uh, up in the tri-state areas, but you know, my, my family and my parents still live there. And I want to thank everybody for all the work you're doing. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions or, or um, um, from here. Great. Thank you so much. That was, that was highly relevant and a great, you know, high yield review. Um, so I want to um, invite, I see Chad is logged in. Chad, you can start lot of, you know, loading up your slides as we talk through some questions that have been posted here uh, for you, Trushar. So someone asked, Bosniak is strictly a CT classification. If an ultrasound clearly describes cysts that seem to have characteristics of Bosniak 2 and below, do you always get a CT to confirm? Uh, typically, if they're small cysts and I and, and if I look at them and they 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 are consistent with a you know with a simple cyst, I typically do not get CT scans on on these uh, on these tumors on these lesions anymore. Okay. What about MRI? Uh, I, I think uh, MRI is overutilized for this. Um, if there was a question on hyperdensity or, you know, sometimes these hyperdense cysts is difficult to tease out between a solid renal mass and a, and a hyperdense cyst. So that is the case where I will consider MRI. But outside of that, I rarely use MRI to manage, to, to look at renal cysts. Okay. Um, someone asked um, about regression of cysts. Um, so have, do you know if there's a certain percentage of Bosniak 3 cysts that can become 2F? Um, were any evidence that cysts, you know, regress in terms of their stage over time? Yeah, I mean, so that, that, that a couple of papers that, you know, I mentioned, the paper from Columbia actually showed that up to 44% of Bosniak 3 and 4 lesions. And again, this is a follow-up period of only two to three years, showed that they, they found that these tumors actually regressed to 2F or lower. Um, so is there an inflammatory component to some of these cysts um, that, that kind of gets treated and they kind of resolve over time? Um, and there was a um, um, in, the, in, in the European paper regarding their follow up that also showed some level of regression over time. So I think, yeah, I think it can happen. It does happen. It's been documented. And I think that's why an aggressive surgical approach to these cysts may not be warranted. And I think almost any patient could be afforded some period of surveillance before you decide I want to go operate on that patient. Okay. And um... Another person asks, are there certain characteristics about 2F cysts that make you more, that are more worrisome for you? Um, I think size. I mean, I, I think uh, that, that's one of the things that we don't know about. Um, many of the papers don't uh, comment on, on cysts greater than four centimeters. So if you have large cysts, I think that's something you have to kind of consider. Um, but again, a 2F cyst, um, you know, if it's a truly a 2F cyst and there's no evidence of any enhancement in septa, which you would, you know, consider as a 3F, I think it's a reasonable option to surveil. Any thoughts on, uh, Dr. Katz asked, if you have any thoughts on percutaneous biopsy or cryoablation of higher risk cysts, especially yeah. bilateral then, or solitary kidney or... Yeah, and I think that's, that, that, that's a reason. I think biopsy is difficult. Uh, uh, you know, we've had experience here where our, our radiologists and interventional radiologists have had difficulty biopsying and getting good samples on, 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 on cystic masses. So I think biopsy, you know, I'm not sure has much utilization um, and there are obviously risks, but um, I think cryoablation for appropriately, you know, located sizable lesions, it's been documented that it, it, it can be used. Um, so I think that's a fair way to kind of manage these patients. Uh, if that's an, if that's available to you. Okay, um, there are a couple more questions in the chat function. If you could, if you could, if you wanna, if you have any time to just address them, 
um, while we load up uh, Chad's talk in the interest of time. Thank you again for your time, for fitting us into your busy day. It's always yeah. a pleasure Thank to you see guys. you. I'm gonna right. I'm gonna apologize to Dr. Rich because I'm gonna I gotta <laughs> run to the operating room. I, I like the you. It looks like he's ready for the OR too. Where'd you get that? You leaving? <laughs> you didn't come for my talk. I listened <laughs> for the last scintillating two minutes. It was amazing. As always. So things never change with this dynamic duo here. <laughs>